Finnovate showcases cutting-edge banking and financial technology through a global conference series featuring short-form demos and thought leadership. Now, the conversation continues on the Finnovate podcast. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Finnovate Podcast. Joining me today, we have Brad Limer of Unconventional Ventures, and we are going to talk about GameStop and Robinhood and fintech in general. I know a lot of people have talked about it already, but there's some interesting pieces to pull out of it that are a little bit different from what general news media outlets are talking about. So first off, Brad, thanks for joining me on the show. Absolutely, Greg. And I'm here to like, you know, pump these five stocks. No, no, just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Are they the same five that Reddit has been pumping? Because I hear that if you get in on it early, you can make a killing. Millions and millions of dollars. Absolutely. <laughs> So uh, before we start, let's jump into a little bit. And I think, you know, we talked a little bit about kind of the state of play, state of trading and the state of wealth right now. I think that's a great kind of little bit of groundwork to lay before we jump into some of the other pieces. Can you talk a little bit about how you see uh, investing functioning right now in our society? Yeah, you know, I, th I think that Twitter almost had a meltdown the past week about what's happened with GameStop and these four or five other stocks and then Dogecoin and like a couple other like cryptocurrencies. And I think people forget that so few people actually do day trading and so few people are actually in crypto. I mean, the crypto brothers and the day traders will say, oh, it's like everybody, everybody's doing it. It's like 1927, 28. This is like the good times. But the reality is it's single digits, you know, and, and as an industry or as an ecosystem, we have to realize that most people's investments and most people's savings are very, very passive. And I think that in itself is sort of the opportunity within this. So if you have most people in, you know, 401ks and other investments where, you know, it's, it's in the high 40s at most, sometimes it goes a little bit higher in terms of people that are actively involved in having investments in the stock market. Well, there's opportunities there to build long-term wealth. Uh, and I think that's a huge lesson for, for fintechs and for banks to really put back into the basics of what you know, we're trying to do is build financial wellness within these folks. It is a good lesson, something to keep in mind. It also, I think, underscores one of the problems that we wanted to talk about. You know, such a, a relatively small percentage of the population participates in this kind of day trading, but yet we saw the news around what happened last week take on a life of its own. It became something that everybody was talking about, even, you know, parents at daycare pickup and things like that are all talking, oh, did you hear what happened with Robinhood and GameStop? So the, this kind of story has a chance to spread really quickly, even though most people aren't doing it. Let's talk a little bit about what that type of conversation means for financial technology as a whole, because we have a situation where in a very public sense, a fintech company, in this case, Robinhood, wasn't able to deliver on one of their core promises. We will trade your stock for you with um, you know, zero fees. They weren't able to deliver that for a moment. It was extremely public and way, way more people heard about that failure than were personally affected by that failure. What does that do to people's perception of financial technology and their trust in financial technology? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you think about you know, like their, their, their uh, PR team and, and marketing team and everybody else. It's just, I can't even imagine like being in those roles right now. Oh God, and yeah, every, that's a tough, tough job. Oh, every, every single conversation they had, you know, including this clubhouse thing that they did with Elon Musk and, and Vlad, the, the CEO, talking about what happened. Everybody wants to know what happened and did you like, you know, do this to us? And, you know, why did you make this choice? And, you know, it was a problem with their balance sheet and, and whether or not, you know, that didn't melt down to what will probably end up be a huge lawsuit. It's like a billion and a half, you know, um, lawsuit that's out there right now. The challenge, you know, for, for what's really happening here. And again, the, the, the lessons I think for fintechs in the space is that when you're messing with people's money, their livelihood, whether it's a day trader or whether it's someone that's simply trying to do regular trades or someone that's trying to use an application to do regular banking, there's a lot of trust involved there. There's a lot of things that could go wrong. And then you, you're starting to hit upon what you, you, you zeroed in on was that, what's it going to do to the industry? You know, what is it going to do when uh, a fintech like this size with millions and tens of millions of people are doing this amount of trading and have this much money involved uh, are going to have a challenge. They've had challenges at Robinhood with technology updates that have stopped people from being able to access 
um, you and I were talking offline about Coinbase and some others about, you know, it's when you have a problem like this, when you have a systematic meltdown because you don't have enough money in your balance sheet to cover all of these trades, what you're basically saying is that fintech's not working. So, so we have to think about, you know, the, the way that they're structured and what they do and what their business model is. So they had problems being able to fulfill these type of orders, which is why they put those blocks on it. So people were not able to trade what they wanted when the stock price was changing. So they wanted to keep the price up. The hedge funds wanted to keep the price down. They weren't able to do that. And so, you know, the, the business model around selling data for, in exchange for free trades is something, you know, that, that really needs to be investigated and it needs to, you know, be lessons for the industry is that how are you actually going to make revenue on these, you know, customers and what they do, what type of transactions, you know, are going to be important. So, you know, it's, it's been frustrating to watch, but it's also frustrating to watch when banks do this kind of stuff too. Right. So, Right. Well, it's certainly not uh, something that only happens to fintech companies, but it does seem like, you know, whatever the reason is, because they offered up an explanation. They, you know, had this outage, they weren't able to do it. They offer an explanation up, but we live in an era where people don't trust what they read. They assume they're being lied to when they read a PR statement. And so, you know, that could very well be the truth. It could be the case that they were trying to protect, you know, a hedge fund corporate owner, right? This is the, the rumor that's kind of going out there. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, people are going to believe what they're going to believe. And to some extent, it doesn't really matter the why behind it. it. It amounts to not being able to deliver on something that you had promised people you would be able to do. And then if you look at these people who aren't in this space, who are now looking at you know, their banks rolling out new fintech products and telling them, hey, you can manage your account online. You can get into your um, retirement account and view the balance and conduct basic transactions there. There's going to be this kind of hesitancy now because I've heard about this fintech stuff. I've heard about these people. It's not working the way it should. And I'm not going to do it. I want to go into a brick and mortar. I want to see you know, a signed paper in front of me. Um, and, and I think the real danger with these kinds of situations is that it makes it harder for people who are outside of the space to feel comfortable coming into the space. And, and I think that's a piece which we have to look at as a fintech industry and say, you know, do we have to hold fintech to a higher standard than the banks that are more established because they've had time to build up more trust. Um, and you could argue that that's unfair, but at the same time, there's you know this belief that it's large, it's FDIC insured, you know, Fidelity's been around forever, Schwab's been around forever. I can trust these big companies in a way that maybe it's more difficult to trust uh, an app that's been around for only you know a couple of years. I think one piece that I wanted to talk about a little bit was. Um, you know, the kind of this has never happened before effect, because this is something we see in fintech as companies come out, they experience a hiccup and they can hide behind this excuse. You know, we didn't anticipate being able to, or having this kind of gamification of the system where people were <laughs> coming together in a massive scale and doing you know, things which are outside of what is really in the historical realm. This has never happened before. So to, to some extent, you could say, should Robinhood get a pass? Because this is a crazy situation. How could they have expected something like this? What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, you, you brought up like gamification and UX and stuff. And there was that case last year where that person tragically took their lives because they saw what looked like a huge loss. Um, in reality, I guess it wasn't. And so they had to deal with that in terms of a PR crisis. Um, I think the challenge, you know, of of what we have here is that we've had almost 15 years of sort of this wave of fintech in this very, very low rate environment in this incredible upsurge of venture capital investment. And you, you, if, if, you know, they had been public already because they're, they're headed toward an IPO, which is honestly, it's great to see uh, fintechs IPO as opposed to yes. get acquired because when they get acquired, they just kind of die. Agreed. Uh, or at least they, they like let the balloon, you know, start to sag a yes. bit. Um, the, the, the interesting thing I think about the last 15 years is that we're still doing so many things wrong, right? We're, we're, mm -hmm. Banks are not meeting the financial needs of most consumers, right? We're talking about in the last 15 years, people in the way that they get income has totally changed with gig workers. Um, people are working longer. Older adults have different needs. You know, we have all of these um, needs for, for women and women and, and not just 
banking, but regular investing. There's uh, a bank that we talked to recently that's focused on the needs of LGBTQ uh, and, and again, unique needs around identity and around uh, transfers of money, you know, when people aren't married and all of these things. And, you know, we, we've left so many people behind and yet we're so focused on, you know, what's happening in venture and fintech and what's happening in the market in fintech. And there's a lot more to do, you know, basic blocking and tackling that, you know, bank, banks and credit unions and sort of regular traditional financial service institutions that are highly regulated, they've built this moat, but this moat is there for a reason. You know, this, this moat is really, you know, partly regulatory, partly, you know, something that I'm really happy that fintech has, you know, poked against and let the dam, you know, burst in some areas um, because things are better for it, but there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah, no, the regulation, the regulatory aspect of this is one that's really interesting because um, this is where you want to see consumer protections come in, right? You want them to be made, you know, ahead of time. You don't want to have a situation where as the game is being played, you feel like the rules change um, and all of a sudden you're not able to do certain things. Um, but I think, you know, Infintech has had a difficult relationship with regulation um, because there are some areas that can move faster than was possible before, but you see a situation like this and you see a little bit of the reason behind some of these regulations and, and why compliance is such a, a big deal because there are people who are exposed. And if this wasn't a regulated environment, um, if this wasn't something where there was a recourse for uh, an authoritative agency to come in and say, hey, we can make this right. You can't come in, you can't take these people's money and not give them a chance to um, buy more stocks or whatever the case may be, you, you see the, the problems that can start to arise from that. And you see, obviously, a very public and painful lesson in this case. But in the big picture, you know, we do need some sort of regulation. I think the problem exists when you have a situation where regulation has been used as a barrier to entry for new players. That's where I start to have a problem with it. And I'm guessing that's what you're kind of talking about with, you know, you're nice to see uh, some, some holes punched here and there. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, regulation and compliance and sort of the the needs to understand, you know, why the rules are in place. You know, this is not, you know, uh, the Facebook type of, um, you know, just mentality of breaking things and fixing things. It never has been. And for those fintechs that have sort of marched down that path, they've always been burned because you're talking again about people's day-to-day -day lives and the money that flows through it. And so, you know, the the message, I guess, for fintech startups is the importance of compliance and understanding regulation, why it's there and how you fit into it and how you can leverage the best of both worlds as you grow a business like this uh, is really important. And, you know, last year when, or I think it was about last year, Robinhood, you know, tried to launch this um, checking account and, you know, did really interesting things when they launched it to say the way it's going to be insured. And it's like, no, no, yep. they should have had people to say, look, hey, we're the adults in the room. Compliance and regulators are not there to say no. They're honestly not. Some of the best conversations I've had at you know banks I've worked in and fintechs I've worked with are with regulators that just want to understand. They just want to understand yeah. what you're doing, and you know that is the the long time conversation for the last fifteen years that I, I tell founders all the time: get somebody who actually knows what they're doing in terms of regulation. Yeah, no, completely agreed. I mean, there just needs to be more communication uh, across the field, but especially between those two groups, because our experience does back up what you're just talking about, that regulators are interested, they want to learn, they have a, you know, specific things they're trying to prevent from happening, but they are, by and large, to your point, just interested in understanding what's happening. And I think from a fintech standpoint, you really have to understand what those regulations are trying to do, where they're coming from. And, and then you know, when you understand the why, I think it becomes easier to build a product or, or to build around it and, and just be more confident that what you're putting out there is going to be okay, is going to be allowed to continue to do business. Um, we are almost out of time, but I want to end on a, a potentially contentious question because I think when you talk about fintech, it obviously means bringing new pieces of technology into a space that hadn't had them before. There are bound to be hiccups when that happens. When you try something new, there are bound to be areas where you kind of run up against something that you haven't seen before. You sort of discover problems as you go. Is this an acceptable price to pay for innovation? Is a situation like what we had last week an acceptable price for innovation, or do we need to look uh, and kind of raise the bar to a point where you say we can't allow this to happen, even if it means that maybe we can't do things as quickly or get products out as quickly as we might like to? 
Yeah, I, I think it, it is an expectation um, that we need to do better. I think it's something that, again, every single fintech founder, every single bank employee, every single ecosystem you know, player, they need to instill in every single business model that at the heart of it, we are taking care of people's money. There's trust involved. There is a necessary you know, um, certitude <laughs> to, to, to have their fiduciary like, needs in the heart of your business model. You need to take care of people. And I just, I don't want to see um, this lesson be the whole, we could continue to break things and get away with it. Um, so let's let's see more companies, you know, continue to grow. Let's see them go public. Let's see them be more transparent. And let's just continue to make banking better. That's what we should all be focused on. I think that's a great place to leave it. Obviously, uh, our industry will continue to change. I'm sure we will continue to find more areas that haven't been explored or new pieces that are going to pop up. You know, we're we're seeing a new type of people a person engaging with finances, which is really cool. You know, I saw um, Mark Cuban thanking that Reddit group for bringing people into the investment space and encouraging people to really look at where, what their money is doing and, and just bringing people in. So, you know, there's going to be large scale changes in terms of how people want to interact with their money, what they want to do with their money. Fintech obviously is going to be a very powerful tool in supporting a lot of these new pieces that are happening. But at the same time, it comes with a lot of pressure. And, and so, you know, I think leaving it with that understanding of you do have an obligation, you have to make sure that you're helping people, you know, the, the do no harm mentality, I think is, is a crucial one. And so if there are lessons to be learned here, I think, you know, it's, it's coming back to that, keep your customer at the forefront of your, of your journey, understand the implications of what you're really doing in the real world. And hopefully we can come out of this um, in, in a better position. Now we'll see what happens with Robinhood specifically, but I think as a, as a whole, I think the industry really can grow as a result of seeing what we've seen over the last week. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll just like, you know, give a plug really quick um, because it's coming out soon, but um, Theo Lau and I have come out with a book that talks about good business models in technology and specifically in fintech. And uh, Beyond Good covers a lot of this stuff and it talks about really at the heart of every single business model needs to be the heart of you know, the consumer and uh, their needs. So uh, look, at, look, look for Beyond Good at koganpage.com. Yeah, check it out. I think I'm in there. I think I have a quote in there. So um, you, absolutely you, know, if you needed do. a more endorsement. Yeah, go get it. Go get it for that reason alone. No, I'm sure there's a lot of people who said way smarter things than me, but uh, it, it is a, I appreciate the work you guys do in the space. I think the book uh, is, is looking good. I'm happy to have been included and um, always a pleasure to catch up, Brad. Thanks so much for taking the time out to chat with me. Look forward to being back at the Disneyland FinTech pretty soon. <laughs> Sounds good. Oh, man, hopefully. Hopefully 2021 is the year. But that's there a topic go. for a different podcast. <laughs> All right, take care. The Finnovate Podcast is produced by Informa Connect in association with Provoke.fm Media. Check out Finnovate.com for information on Finnovate's upcoming shows and to learn how you can get involved. The discount code Finnovate Podcast will save you 20% on tickets to all of our events. And you can email us at info at for information on sponsoring, speaking, or demoing. Thanks for listening. 